Hey YouTube, today we're going to talk about the context length limit in large language models. We'll start by talking about why is it such a challenge to increase and then talk about techniques like alibi and landmark attention that actually allows us to increase the context limit. So let's get started. So before we can get into what makes increasing context link challenging, we just need to review a few concepts, starting with big O notation, otherwise called worst case. And this measures the time or space complexity of doing our calculations, meaning how if we add an element to something, how, are we, how much are we going to increase the CPU time or memory usage? And the most common examples would be O of 1, otherwise called constant complexity. So for example, if I add an element to a hash map, searching for elements in that hash map remains a constant amount of time. Linear complexity, such as iterating over a 1D array, um, if I add an element, I've increased the amount of time to do that linearly. So if it took me one second to go over one element, It'll take me two seconds to go over two, three to go over three, and so forth. And then there's quadratic complexity, which such as iterating over a 2D array. So if I double the number of elements in an array or in a uh, quadratic complexity, I have added four times the time or space complexity, and that's what we're going to see with the attention layer. So this gets worse as we go up. So if I add or four times the elements, I now have 16 times the time or space complexity. So this grows very, very quickly. Then we need to remember embedding dimensions, um, where embedding dimensions are higher dimensional representations of similarity, where a lot of embedding dimensions are 768, 100, or 1024, 4096 dimensions. And the way to think of embeddings is if we take a lower dimensional one like a sphere, we can cluster like things together. So if we have this constellation, this could be car concepts like an engine, we could have a trunk and so forth of, of car ideas being clustered together. And if you'd like to learn more about embeddings, we do have our video here and we'll link that above. Um, but Token embeddings for N tokens create an N by D embedding matrices. So if we have 10 tokens and our embedding dimension is 768, we would have a 10 by 768 embedding uh, matrix. Then we have positional encoding. And we do this because we want the model to understand positionality of tokens. And we don't want to have to use indices to do that because we don't want to carry around additional memory. It would be nice if this was bounded between negative one and one, and each positional encoding should be unique. And sine and cosine work very well for this. So we can do sinusoidal positional encoding. And this is done by using a scaling factor in both the sine and the cosine, where we use the sine for zero and even numbered tokens and uh, or uh, positions and cosine for the odd. And the scaling factor uh, it can be what you want it to be, but in the example of the attention is all you need paper is one divided by 10,000 raised to two times the token count divided by the dimensionality of our attention heads. Then finally, a connectivity graph. And a connectivity graph describes who is related to who. And there are two types, directed and undirected, where in the directed graph, we can describe if like going between cities, for example, if you can go from Albuquerque to Los Lunas, but the road back from Los Lunas to Albuquerque is closed, you could describe that with a directed graph. But in an undirected, if someone is connected, they are connected in both ways. And you can think of this as like friendship maps. So if we have Jane and Alex and Bob, and Jane and Alex and Bob are all friends, then they would all be connected by edges, and their values between them would all be ones. But what if Jane only knew Alex and Jane only knew Bob? Then Alex and Bob would not be connected. And if we look at the what we would call an adjacency matrix, we would see that they have zeros here instead of ones. So now let's move on and talk about the actual challenges in increasing our context length. So there are really two things that make it difficult for us to increase our context length of our large language models, especially locally. 
with the first thing being computational complexity in both our attention layer and our embedding dimension. So for our attention layer, the complexity is quadratic in both the time and the memory spaces. So what that means, if, it's, if it takes one second for us to compute in tokens, then it will take four seconds if we want to compute to n tokens, but this grows very, very quickly. So if we want to do four n tokens, it will now take 16 seconds for those four n tokens. And this applies to our memory space as well. So if it took 256 megs of RAM for our n tokens, it will take one gig of RAM for our two n tokens. And this unfortunately also applies to our embedding dimension, especially when our embedding dimension D is much greater than our token count. And so this has the same limitation as the attention layer. The next thing is positional encoding. And this is a little, this is a little strange to understand, but the sinusoidal positional encoding has no extrapolation ability. And so what that means is if we consider the following three tokens, walk the cat, this is going to be three tokens, and that will just tokenize into say, oh, 101, 121, and 103. And then we're going to embed these. And remember our embedding dimension times our number of tokens gives us our matrice. So if we have a three dimensional embedding, this will create a three by three matrix. And let's just say the values in it are 1.1, 3.1, 1 1.3, and so forth. And for each of these positions, we're going to add these alternating sines and cosines. And these are just little waveforms bounded between one and negative one, but they change their shape depending on their coefficients for that W we saw earlier. And so, each of these are going to be unique. So as we go past the 2048 token limit that we train the model on, it just doesn't know what the waveform is. It, it's not familiar with it. So it gets kind of confused. Um, you could kind of compare it to if you're a medical doctor and you're looking at an MRI for an alien species. It looks kind of familiar, but the details don't make a lot of sense. And so why do these matter? Well, if we could work around this computational complexity, especially of our attention and embedding space, then we could kind of trivially at least train or use higher uh, token counts. And if we could somehow mitigate the problems introduced by positional encoding and generalize token position in a way that the model can understand, then we could have much larger contexts either trained or initially fine tuned later. So now let's move on to a solution to at least positional encoding. So one option that we have to increase our token context length is use something called alibi, otherwise known as attention layer with linear biases. And the basic idea is to replace the sinusoidal positional encoding with a bias instead. So we can remove the sinusoidal positional encoding and attach a bias at our attention heads which is done by soft maxing on the query key embeddings plus some slope. And the slope varies by the number of attention heads we have, but the general function is two raised to the negative eight divided by n, where n is our number of multi-head attention layers. And this has a trailing bias. So closer tokens are gonna to have a higher bias and tokens that are further away are gonna have a lower bias. But this is much easier for the network to extrapolate as compared to kind of sine and cosine values. So we can typically fine tune or train the model after we've already trained it to have a much wider context by using this bias instead. But what's happening? So in the attention head, we're gonna compute our attention score, which is our query times our key values. And then we're going to add a small bias with this slope. And then we're just going to soft max it, which just normalizes our data. And this is gives us a benefit of not only greatly increasing the context, but also speeds up our training.
And it does work with models that were originally trained with sinusoidal positional encoding. So all we have to do is remove the sinusoidal positional encoding and fine tune the model to know how to work with the trailing bias instead. But its weakness is that tokens that are farther away have very little influence on the final output. So there is still some issues with being able to reference back to tokens that were further away. But there are other techniques that we can use to uh, also increase our context length by uh, modifying how attention is working. If we could decrease the computational memory complexity of our attention layer, then we could pretty trivially increase our context length. And this can be achieved by methods like sparse attention, which takes advantage of the fact that not all, uh, not all tokens are created equally. And if we could ignore unimportant tokens and focus more on important tokens, then we could reduce our computational complexity from quadratic closer to linear. So let's take, for example, the sentence, the cool cat eats food. And this also happens to be all of the tokens in our vocabulary. Then we could view our attention layer as being a connectivity graph or matrix where standard attention is a fully connected graph. And so as we add tokens, we um, have an M by N matrix, which leads to our quadratic complexity. So we can use uh, methods of sparse attention, such as extended transformer construction, to help us reduce this complexity. So if we come back to the same sentence, the cool cat eats the food, we could use a window size of three tokens, where at the beginning and the end, it is a little off of the token. So the first one would be the cool. The next window would be the cool cat, then cool cat eats, then cat eats food, and then eats food. And that results in this connectivity matrix, which is a lot lighter. And the more tokens that we have in our vocabulary, the more benefit we get out of this reduction. And you can use any window size that you would like. Larger window sizes do tend to keep the context uh, more in frame, but smaller are easier to compute. And we end up with a connectivity graph that looks something like that. Um, the extension to this is called Big Bird, which combines these local and global mechanisms with a random mechanism that allows us to keep a broader uh, scope of the context in context. And this follows the same sliding window as we can see here, but if we wanted to keep the fact that we're eating cat food in scope, then we could follow some heuristic that would allow us to relate cat and food. But these are powerful, but they do have weaknesses, specifically just like Alibi, the access to the past tokens is not super flexible and we can't provide focus on arbitrary past tokens. And this does result in a problem with keeping all of the context uh, reachable. But now landmark attention is what changes this. And so let's move on and see how powerful it is. One of the most recent ways of increasing the context length is through landmark attention, which is just kind of a better sparse attention. Now, there really is a lot going on in landmark attention, so we're going to just touch the surface of it and what the idea is, and then we'll go into more depth next week when we actually fine tune our own landmark model for increasing our context length. But the basic idea is to leverage the transformer's attention layer for it to pick out what are important tokens rather than trying to use a heuristic. And this really gives a lot more explicit control over how the attention mechanism utilizes previous or further out tokens and really does take advantage of attention strengths and providing um, tokens from the past rather than a heuristic. But if we take this over here, for example, and we have five tokens, A, B, C, D, and E, we would want to see what standard attention will do. And let's say A and B kind of important, C and B very important. And then we would get the completion E. Well, with landmarks, we would want to insert those tokens uh, every say two tokens. So now we've broken out AB and CB, 
And we see for these contexts, A and B is important, but C and B over here are not. Despite the fact they're both token B, the only one of the B tokens is being taken into a lot of consideration by the attention. So once we've broken these out, we can use attention to decide which text is important. So it acts kind of like a self summarization system. So how this happens is the attention layer has what are called query, key, and value. And this query, key, and value or sets are just linear transform transformations on our input. And you can think of query as being the question or completion that you've requested, the key being metadata about possible completions, and the values being the completions themselves. So if we took a movie recommendation system, for example, your query could be you the type of movie you're searching for. The keys would be metadata about movies, and then the values would be the possible completions. So if you were to ask for a horror movie, you would look for keys that included horror movie, and then you would eventually get a horror movie back. But what happens when we consider the query and the key together, we get our a type of embedding. And this embedding can get nested into all of our chunks. So if we take this again here and we extend the notion to more than just two blocks, if we have 20 blocks and these blocks all have an embedding to them in their query key, then we can get an idea of who is the most related. So if these are not related, but these two are related, and our attention score is very high for both, then we can have the model automatically select these two chunks for using in our completion, but ignore these. And we'll go over an actual example of this over here in just a moment. But the basic idea of what's happening is we are going to use the query and key to build embeddings. Then we're going to softmax those to compute our attention score. And then we're going to use that attention score with our values, again, our possible completions, to determine who are the most important tokens. And this allows us to be very selective on which chunks are used for the final completion. So let's take, for example, this prompt here, where we're going to give it a passcode, a bunch of junk, a passcode again, and then more junk. So we instruct the model that there is important information hidden inside a bunch of irrelevant text, and then we give it a pass key, and then we ramble about cake, then we give it another key, then we ramble about cake again. And now these chunks of noise could be thousands and thousands of tokens, but then we finally ask the model, what are the pass keys? The pass keys are, and we want the completion to be the pass keys. Well, the attention mechanism, if we fine tune it correctly, will learn to take this portion of our prompt and build from this on our landmark token. So we would be splitting the text up and creating chunks. It would score these two chunks here as being much higher, these being very low, and our embeddings would relate these two chunks of text together. So I know there's a lot going on, but the basic idea is we are using embeddings to figure out these two phrases are about passcodes and I want passcodes. And then the attention mechanism is paying the most attention to those passcodes because of what it needs to complete. And that allows us to have a much more arbitrarily long context because we can weed out the noise and pay more attention to the highly specific context. So that's the power behind landmark attention and what it can do for us in increasing our context length. And next week on Tuesday, we're going to do a fine tune of a landmark model and tomorrow in our live stream, get our data set up. If this was helpful, please like and subscribe and let us know in the comments below what you'd like to hear about next and tune in Sunday for our live stream where we'll be going over creating a training set for landmark attention and then check our video on Tuesday when we'll be actually doing the fine tuning for landmark attention.
See y'all next time.